Hello, my name is Luis Sia, and I'm happy to be making this presentation for the American Society for Gravitational and Space Research Plus 10 today in the year 2030. Remember 2020? I've been trying to forget it, and who would have guessed 2027 would have brought us so many surprises, huh? And this talk is about reminiscing of important milestones, events, and changes that happened in the decade of the 2020s when it comes to microbiology research in space. I know that would take too long to cover, so I've chosen three specific topics that are some of my favorites. The use of microgravity for the search, identification and utilization of molecular targets for novel antimicrobial approaches, the birth and growth of the field of space biomining, and that at last we have taken the preparation of the next generation of space microbiologists to space itself. Remember when it was pretty awesome when students could get involved with experiments performed in space? Well, it was great to see this grow into actual lab courses taking place in space. Now, I remember back in the 2010s when I talked about how research in space could help with the fight against antimicrobial resistance, a problem that back then killed over 100,000 people a year. And when I talked about that, people used to ask me, so what does that have to do with space? And I would say, Evolution. See, our about four and a half billion year old planet has hosted life for about three and a half billion years. During this time, environmental conditions have changed a lot. I'm talking about changes in surface temperature, atmosphere composition, ocean salinity, you name it. But something has remained constant through all this time. And that's gravity. Through the three and a half billion years, life has evolved from single cell organism to the complex systems and ecosystems we see today under about the same gravitational conditions. But with research in space, we can treat gravity not as a constant, but as an independent variable to observe how cells and organisms behave differently when something that has been there through the course of evolution is suddenly changed. This has allowed us to unmask processes and phenomena that we, could, that we couldn't see in the 1G environment of Earth. Sure, some things similar to this had been done prior to 2020, but with all the new in situ omic analysis capabilities of the 2020s, we have now been able to do systematic studies with thousands of microbial species, allowing us to understand what processes and phenomena are indeed coming through the tree of life. And I'll give an example here. Apoptosis, or programmed cell death, used to eliminate unwanted cells, and in the case of some bacterial cultures, hypothesized to take place so that uh, the death of some cells can increase the chances of survival of the overall colony. So this is a, a program uh, cell death mechanism that some cells have, and some people have asked themselves, well, the bacteria that we can no longer kill with our current anti antimicrobials, can we uh, make them uh, kill themselves through these uh, apoptosis pathways? And the problem is that in most cases, the regulator of those pathways also regulates resistance mechanisms to other things like acidity, oxidative stress, and antimicrobial themselves. So you could potentially take a bad bug and make it worse. But by doing studies in microgravity, uh, we could find novel apoptosis pathways, something that you could not see in the 1G environment of Earth, which could then in turn um, help us identify new molecular targets and resulting in molecules being tested to go at these targets to make drug-resistant bacteria kill itself, basically. And this is part of that molecule testing, is part of the FDA process that goes from promising molecules to hopefully drugs on the market. And then there's the uh, case for space biomining. I remember I started working on this back in 2019, I think, and feels only like one or two years ago, time flies. And back then it sounded very sci-fi to a lot of people, but in fact, it was very far from that. Back in 2020, the use of microbes to extract chemical species from rocks and regolith which is the definition of power mining, was already being used to acquire silver, zinc, nickel, rare earth elements, and uranium. In fact, by the late 2010s, 5% of the gold mined on earth 
and 15% of the copper mined on Earth were coming from biomining processes. But I think the most fi part of the sci-fi of, of how people saw this back then was from the fact of implementing these processes in space. The idea is that you could have organisms help you process lunar, asteroid, Mars regolith, the, the dust, so that you can acquire elements of interest. And that changed in 2020, in fact, and a little bit earlier than that with the early experiments like Micro 12, Bio Rock, and Bio Asteroid, and others that followed. And some of them were focused originally on microbial characterization, trying to first demonstrate if the bacteria used on Earth for biomining could also grow in space. And then if the processes of biomining that they could perform were not hindered in the microgravity environment of space. And when it was demonstrated that indeed this could be done in space, two steps followed. And these are parallel efforts, microbial engineering. So finding the genes that conferred an enhanced survival and optimization of the biomining process. So meaning <clears throat> what genes were giving these bacteria a, a better uh, rate of survival as well as having the, the system need less substrates, you had to give it less input while optimizing the output, the element of extraction of interest. In parallel were the bioreactor development efforts. So these have to go hand in hand. You need the, the, micro, the, the biological system as well as the engineering system. And once these two were uh, further developed, they merged again with in situ verification. So biomining microbes grown in space under this, inside these bioreactors, not only to characterize their behavior, but actually to demonstrate, to verify that these biomining processes could take place. And the coolest part of this is that this did not take place only in lower Earth orbit, but also on lunar orbit and the gateway and on the lunar surface. And now at the end of the 2020s, we can see the early production, very minute amounts granted, starting, uh, for example, with iron. So using Shawanella on the densis to reduce iron-3 present on the lunar regolith into iron-2 or ferrocyte iron that could then be easily segregated from the rest. And then once you have this isolated iron, that could be fed into 3D printers. Iron here just being an example of the many things that they can help us to establish um, the human presence beyond lower Earth orbit. And if you think biomining in space attracted a lot of folks into science and engineering and technology and math, well, I think STEM hadn't had a boost this big in forever uh, until teaching in space started. Look at this picture. These uh, graduate students and postdocs really look like astronauts back in the 2010s. And one of the things I really like about this picture is the diversity. And the other thing is, think about it. The PhD students, the postdocs, etc that are trying to design new systems and experiments don't have to imagine it anymore from their labs. They can actually perform these experiments in space. And we haven't seen a push on science, space science and space technology <clears throat> development since this begun. And this is not limited to <clears throat> microbiology, but this is now seen as well for orbital dynamics, robotics, environmental control and life support system design, human factors, bioastronautics in general. And as professors and teachers, there's something, there's very few things that are as fulfilling as seeing the promise of your students being achieved, unlocking that promise on the next generation. So here I show three topics that uh, are not random. These are topics that I'm interested, I'm passionate about, and that I'm working on in one way or the other. So please feel free to reach out if you think we can collaborate, starting but not exclusively with white papers to inform the next decadal survey so that this is on the radar, that we have this as something on the roadmap that we want to see as a reality in 2030. Thank you for your time.